Hello, I'm Bob Trubshaw. I'd like to talk to you today about why the earliest Anglo-Saxon churches were less about piety and more about economic regeneration. I think that most of you will be aware that from the 12th to the 16th centuries, the monasteries in Britain were typically complex communities of clergy and lay members, and they were wealthy. Sure, some of that wealth was used to support the poor and the infirm, but there was still enough wealth for a considerable amount of conspicuous consumption, not least the construction of the Gothic abbeys, some of which later evolved into cathedrals. What about the counterparts to monasteries at the time of conversion to Christianity in the 7th century? Were they wealthy too? Well, the honest answer is we don't really know, but we know that they became wealthy quite quickly. And it doesn't take much imagination to recognise that erecting all the accommodation and the farming buildings that went with an early church required a substantial investment of time and money. Vast quantities of wood needed to be felled for multiple houses and, well, at least in central Wiltshire, if not necessarily elsewhere, for defensive palisades on top of earth banks. One of the bigger houses would be for a priest and become the place of worship, although most of the residents would be directly involved in farming. And some things never change. Then, as now, somebody was expecting to get a good return on their investment. The earliest churches were different to later ones in one significant way. There was little of the pastoral care that only became important around a thousand years later. In the 7th century, churches were shrines. Shrines that made money from votive offerings to whatever statues or icons or other venerated objects were in them. Just as shrines, with or without a building around them, had been the focus of votive offerings for a great many generations before the conversion to Christianity. Furthermore, once a generation had passed after the church was founded, then there would be the grave and other relics of the priest who had founded the church, who would quickly be promoted to a local saint, um, just as the graves and burial mounds of more secular founding fathers of settlements had been and continued to be. And that's not me arguing that churches were little more than shrines making money. In slightly more measured words, that's the opinion of such noted Anglo-Saxonists as John Blair and John Nightingale in works they published nearly 20 years ago. How did this come about? Well, let's briefly step back a century or two before the Anglo-Saxons. In England, farming, and indeed life in general, took a big step backwards early in the 5th century when the Roman army went back to the continent. We know that farming continued, but, so much as we have any evidence, it seems mostly to have been pastoral rather than arable. In the next hundred years or so, the Angles, Saxons, Jutes and Frisians settled near the east coast and moved steadily westwards. By the 7th century, the only parts of England yet to be settled by Anglo-Saxons were in the south-west, Devon, Cornwall, Somerset, and the English side of the Welsh marches, up to Cumbria in the north-west. Initially, Wiltshire was, as it were, split down the middle along the ridgeway, as several place names to the immediate west, such as Cheryl and Carn, are Brythonic, not Germanic. In the 6th century, farming remained dominated by stock rearing, although some arable was necessary. But the Roman heavy plough was no longer in use, so arable land quickly became choked with perennial weeds. I have discussed this in a previous video about the evolution of Anglo-Saxon farming. But, in part because of connections via the Christian clergy, the Anglo-Saxons living in England were aware that in parts of Francia, controlled by the Merovingian dynasty, the heavy plough had remained in use and made arable farming much more successful. But it wasn't simply a case of buying a plough on the continent and having it shipped over. These ploughs needed eight oxen to pull them, and those oxen had to be in prime condition during ploughing season which was typically February into March, just when there was little or no grazing. Haymaking was still in the future. However, the management of woodland pasture for winter fodder was practised. And one plough and eight oxen was just way too big an investment for a single farmer to afford, still less used profitably. So a group of farmers needed to collaborate on raising the oxen and sharing the use of the plough and the ox team which meant they needed to live fairly close together. 
which at the time is not what Anglo-Saxon farmers were doing. Instead, they were living in separate farmsteads about a kilometre apart, sometimes more. Now, sometime around the 8th to 10th centuries, the use of the heavy plough became so widespread that most parts of England changed everything around and created the nucleated villages that are fundamental to just about all of England's geography since. But the earliest churches were created at least 200 years before this. The logical deduction is that the earliest churches were part of pioneering nucleated settlements. Back in 2005, leading Anglo-Saxon historian John Blair remarked that earliest churches appeared to be places of economic importance, as he phrased it. And most of them do indeed evolve into medieval market towns and even 19th century industrial centres. But that's simply looking at things down the wrong end of the telescope. The discovery in 2010 of a 7th century iron coulter in Limming in Kent provided evidence that the heavy mould-board plough developed by the Romans had returned to England several centuries earlier than previously thought. And the settlement at Limming was an early minster, in a location ideally suited to waterborne trade across the Channel. As I discussed in previous videos on early churches of waterborne transport, all the earliest churches are either on the coast or at places along rivers that are ideally suited for loading and unloading flat bottom craft. And the locations of these earliest churches often seem to be successors to Roman estate centres, which were also situated to allow produce to be transported by water. These Roman estate centres seemingly straddle both sides of a valley. Plausibly, they go back to Bronze Age or even Neolithic land units originating with seasonal grazing practices for livestock which use both meadows in the valley bottoms and wood pasture on the higher ground. Arable farming typically allows the production of grain. Wheat and barley were the main such crops in Anglo-Saxon England. Grain can be stored for a year or more, so there is some insurance if future crops fail because of poor weather and the Anglo-Saxon chronicles tell us of just such problems on a rather frequent basis. Furthermore, grain can be transported more easily than other agricultural produce. That means excesses can be sold for profit, or used to pay tributes and taxes to the king and the church. Profitable trade was necessary to pay for the costly needs of the clergy. Liturgical items for the Eucharist, vestments for the priests, altar cloths, wine, incense a copy of the Gospels in a jewel-encrusted binding, plus herbal remedies, such as opium. These would mostly have been brought across the North Sea from trading places around the estuaries of the Rhine and Meuse. We know that many of these items came via a succession of trading places across the continent, from Constantinople and thence the Silk Roads to India and China. Even if the physical artefacts have not survived, motifs on decorative metalwork and needlework from the Middle East and India entered into the types of decoration used in continental and English churches. Now, the foliate face is one of them. Now, Leicestershire may be one of the most inland counties in the country, but it was never isolated as the various river systems enable waterborne transport. The Saw, Reek and the Devon and Smite all connect to the Trent and the Humber estuary, while the Welland, Chater and Gwash flow more directly into the North Sea. Earliest churches were located where the transport of goods and people by water was easiest, and some of those journeys began or ended on the continent, especially the parts from which the Angles, Saxons, Jutes and Frisians had migrated, using boats just a few generations previously. Although documentary evidence is unavailable, there are several strands of archaeological and topographical evidence which shed some light, and all of them shed the same light. Firstly, the heavy plough was reintroduced into England because of trade and cultural contacts across the North Sea to Francia. Secondly, the types of settlements needed to support and use heavy ploughs were copied from the continent. Yep, you heard that right. What historians call minsters were part of a package of economic regeneration developed over the previous 200 years in the parts of the continent the Anglo-Saxons traded with. And thirdly, during the same two centuries, Christianity had become the dominant religion on the continent. So, earliest churches in England came about because of the need to trade with the continent. 
and we're a close-knit package of trade, arable farming, nucleated settlements, and Christianity with its attendant literacy. Piety and pastoral care were not an integral part of this mix. We would best think of Minsters as being somewhat like the 18th century settlements planted in the New World or other third world countries by colonial countries such as Britain. In the 18th century, steel axes and other tools, western medicines, new crops such as tobacco, cotton, tea and coffee, along with literate and proselytising missionaries, all arrived as an inseparable bundle supported by trade with the colonising country. Most of these pioneering colonial settlements quickly became places of economic importance and evolved into towns and even major seaports. And quite frankly, 17th century colonialism seems a very good match for the colonisation of England a thousand years before. The 7th century investment in these minsters generally paid off and they became at least as much trading places as mother churches. Some, although certainly not all, evolved into medieval market towns and 19th century industrial cities. These days a cathedral is not why a city is economically important. And removing retrospective notions of piety, the church wasn't why minsters were successful. Minsters were investments in levelling up the English economy to emulate profitable European precedents. But in 7th century England, the clergy had best access to the financial resources to make such investments. So, to end with a soundbite, the reason England became Christian in the 7th century had more to do with ploughs than piety. <laughs>